Um, it's made of photons. Okay, so photons. Is that backwards to you? No. Okay, it is to me, so I'm not even gonna look at the screen. Um, so photons. Um, what is a photon? What do you What do you know already? Anybody that else know that word already? Did you want me to answer? Yeah. Do you know what a photon is? Do, yeah, do we know? Like the um, way that they explain the packets of energy. That okay. Flow in the light, like you know. All right. Um, so in chemistry, when you were doing energy levels or atoms, so we had uh, the, the diagram where we'd have uh, energy level here, energy level here, and it kept getting shorter as we go up, right? Yeah, it's like what's emitted or absorbed when electrons change. Right. And this is, if you think in terms of the Bohr's model, Uh, in, in terms of the Bohr's model of the atom, which assumed it was like a planet uh, solar system. And so we would start with an electron in what is called the ground state, and it would be pushed up to, let's say we take it from n equals one to n equals three, we, we give it an energy and push it to that state. Uh, and then sometime later it falls back down as it falls down, this is an electron. As the electron falls back down, it emits, and the symbol we use for photon is the gamma, um, emits a photon. And the wavelength of that photon, uh, the color of that light is a function of how far it fell. And there's an equation that they give you. Um, and so this is the energy of the photon is H and it's times, and I use the frequency F. I know it's a new in chemistry class. Uh, it is in AP physics too, but this is just the book uses that. So the energy of a color of light is equal to some of this H is called Planck's constant not at all relevant to what we're doing today, times the frequency of the light. And then if we, if we use the V equals F lambda equation, um, it's the same F. And so the frequency is actually the uh, V over the wavelength. And so it's actually H V over wavelength. Uh, this is why we use F in this year, because the V looks like a new all the time in the handwritten. So the energy of light is each equal to Planck's constant, which is like it's called the, the small structure. It's just a very, very small number times the speed of light divided by the wavelength of the light. Um, and that's just, that's all it is. And so they say this is a photon. Um, and because the reason that Annie referred to this as a packet of energy, um, because it falls a given amount of distance, there are only certain wavelengths of light possible. So if I can go from n equals three to n equals one, n equals three to n equals two, like an electron can't get stuck in between orbits. It has to go to a specific level. Uh, because it goes to specific levels from, some to, from somewhere to somewhere specific, it's always a certain amount of energy. It can't be um, random in the middle of that. And so we, we refer to that as a quantity of light. And the word is quanta a certain amount of energy carried off. Um, and so photon is the name of the particle we give to light. And that's weird because light, um, and so this is a question, just a general one. You may or may not run into this. Does light have mass? Because if it's a particle, it's a thing, right? <clears throat> so does light have mass? Wait, Anybody ever heard? Kind of. Kind of, okay. So there was an experiment. Um, let's say we have this, you know, the super, super high quality uh, chemistry balance. So it's a digital scale, reads real high quality, like say go, go to 10 decimal places. And if I have here a flashlight and I flick it on real quick, the light hits that scale and the scale actually reads a small number for an instant. And so the light, we, we say it exerts a pressure more than a mass. There, there's a light pressure uh, that pushes on things. And that's really kind of cool. So, and that's one of the evidences for light being a particle. And so light has a particle property. And so that's where we get the idea for the photon from. But light does other stuff. Um, if I send light, like if I have just, a, this, this is a demonstration of an idea and I'll show you later when we get this. If I have this, this 
box with a really, really tiny opening. And I mean, this is like a fraction of the diameter of a human hair. And I put behind here a light bulb. Uh, actually, I need two openings. Let me do another, get another opening here, just to kind of fake it. I put a light bulb right here. What I see is that when the light comes out, so I have a really, really bright light bulb emitting light in all kinds of directions here. But through, through this opening, I get a light wave that goes this way and I get one that goes through this way. And where the two down here interact, it creates patterns of bright and dark spots. Uh, this process is called diffraction. Again, we'll, we will cover this when we get to it in the core, D-I-A-C-T-I-O-N, diffraction. Uh, and this is a where light waves are interfering with one another. Um, and so this is a wave property. And so light has a particle behavior I can't spell P-A-R-T-I-C-L-E, and it has a wave behavior. And so light has what is referred to as a dual nature. It can be both a wave and a particle. Um, and this is, this is the intro to quantum physics, which we're not doing right now, but light can be both a wave and a particle, and it depends on what we're looking at is how it behaves. All right, now, Having said that that's cool, we're gonna pretend that light is a wave for now. Um, in fact, it is referred to as an electromagnetic wave. Light is electromagnetic in nature. Um, that is, it behaves and exhibits the, the properties of electricity uh, and of magnetism simultaneously. And in fact, if I were to draw a sketch of light wave, um, and so let's pretend that it's a transverse wave traveling this way. So that light wave would have a transverse behavior in the electric field. This would be an E field. The, the, the pink line would be an E field. And it would also simultaneously have a wave that's in the magnetic field. And that's, we use letter B for magnetism. Um, and so it would have both of those. And in fact, we would see that the electric field, if we, if we look at it head on, the electric wave of light bounces up and down while the magnetic wave bounces left to right. So the B field goes left to right and the magnetic field goes up and down and they must always be perpendicular to one another. Um, and so all light waves have, have both an electric field and a magnetic field. And so if I pass a light beam through an area of space where I have like a giant electric charge built up, uh, then I can cause light to change directions. If I pass a light wave between two magnets, I can cause it to change directions. Um, and that's, that's the evidence of its behavior. It has both of those. And because of this, um, we, we have some behaviors that come out to be. Uh, one of them is referred to as polarization. And I'll, I've got a, a slide for that here in a minute, I'll show you. Um, and so what I can do is essentially, let me just switch over to it. It's gonna be faster if I do that. Uh, I haven't started the show uh, or this presentation yet. So let me get, I'll just, I'll just show you the pictures here. I've got, I've got a PowerPoint I was working on. Um, so polarization is, is a characteristic of light. Um, and so what we see here is that light has <clears throat> the, <coughs> it vibrates in two dimensions. It vibrates both up and down and left to right. And if I pass it through a polarizing filter, and so imagine a polarizing filter, um, kind of like, so I've got this wave and if I pass it through what I'm gonna call a picket fence, if I've got a, a bunch of uh, slats that are real close together, um, then I eliminate one of these planes of vibration. Um, so what would this, this is a bad picture, I guess. Let me just, let me show you this. So this, I don't know if you guys can see this. Let me stop this chair real quick. So this is a polarizing lens. Um, or just so I can see, see what you're doing here or what I'm doing. So you can see through there, right? You can see the word light particle through there. There's a bit of a glare here. Gosh, uh, can I get rid of the glare and make it worse? I can make it worse. Um, there, now you can see it, okay. Uh, so you can see, this is kind of like sunglasses, right? And I've got a second one. And where the two overlap, if I turn one, get it somewhere that 
and stay in focus here and get the angle right. As I turn it, I'm turning the bottom one, it's eliminating the light. All right. So what that and so if I just slide them the sideways, you can see through either one of them, but where they overlap, I've rotated one of them so that they're there. So what these are are two picket fences um, that have been so they're parallel when you can see through them, but when I rotate them like this, it blocks off almost all the light. Um, hang on a second, Mr. Turner needs to talk to me. I'll be right back. For so light rays being both parallel. Uh, I mean, it's having these two axes of vibration. If I pass in through this, through a fence that looks like this, they get, get through. But if I do this, then I'm blocking out one plane of vibration. And so if you buy uh, sunglasses, they can be what are called polarized sunglasses. And one lens, notice it just makes it darker. But the second lens, when I rotate them, it does go, in fact, go back and block out that light. Now, there's something peculiar we found out about that. If we had a third, third light, and I can't do it here at the demo because I need the light source. Um, this is actually a cool quantum effect. If I had a third polarizing filter, it actually gets brighter, uh, which is weird. And nobody knows why, and they can't explain that. That's some new physics they're working on. Um, but so light is, again, a electromagnetic wave. When we're talking about it as a wave, it has both electric fields and magnetic fields. And they always, one, one thing of note is they always vibrate perpendicular to one another. Now, because it is a wave, uh, we have referred to, and you guys all know there's colors, right? And, and I assume that nobody's completely colorblind. There are colors. And so what we do with colors, let me bring up my uh, slide again. I'll go to that one. Um, so what are the colors of light? That's the question. Um, and so when I it, when it look at it, so yeah, go ahead. Oh, never mind. I was just no. going to answer, but... Well, but I mean, no, no. So we, and they're different here. So I, th this has additive and subtractive here. Uh, they're different. Light um, is actually, in all light, uh, is actually just some combinations of the red, the green, and the blue. And you may have thought about your computer monitor as RGB. Uh, monitor it used to be called an RGB. I don't know if you guys are, have been around long enough to know that, uh, but all colors are made out of, uh, of light, of red light, green light, or blue light. And in, in art class, what do they tell you were the primary colors back in art class? Is it red, yellow, blue? Yeah, they said red, yellow, blue, and that was actually not, I mean, it's not exactly true. Um, so red is a primary color of light, but red is not a primary color pigment. And so when I, I'm talking about pigments, we're talking about paint, and that's what we're talking about. So if you see here in this circle, these are the paint or inks colors. It's, it's magenta, not red. It is yellow, and it's not really blue. It's called cyan. Um, and so if you have a crayon box, you probably have a magenta crayon, a yellow crayon, and a cyan crayon. And if you have a, an inkjet printer or a color laser printer at home, it's referred to as a CMYK printer. Um, stands for cyan, magenta, yellow, and K is for black. Um, so if I take all of the, if I take the red, the yellow, and the blue paint and stir it together, what color do I get? Red, yellow, and blue. What do you remember? What color you get when you did? I know you did that. Anybody remember? Is it black? It, it would be, but it's actually more of an ugly brown. With the, if I use true red, true yellow, and true blue. I'm missing uh, the wavelength down here in the cyan spectrum. Uh, and so it doesn't go black. But if I take true magenta, true yellow, and, and true cyan colors and put all three of them close together, if I put a dot in your, your, the way your dot matrix printer works, it puts a dot of each color right next to each other. And so the three of those, of those together look black uh, when you see. And so what we see, so let's say I'm wearing a reddish shirt right now. Um, it, my, my shirt is actually, you know, the ink color of my shirt is actually every color except red. Um, it reflects red light. So when you look at something that's a blue shirt or a, a green whatever, plant or whatever, um, it's actually, you're seeing what is called reflected light. And so you're actually seeing the colors that that thing doesn't contain. Uh, so a blue shirt actually doesn't contain any blue in it. It contains every color except blue, 
because it absorbs every color except blue and reflects the blue light. And so the things that we say are blue are what we're really saying is that they're reflecting blue light. And so when you're in a room uh, with, with white light, and it's really hard, like your house lights are probably not white, uh, but we pretend they are. If you have white light shining on something, you can see any color. But if I were to shine just red light on something, then I would not be able to see things that are green or that are blue because there's no red in either of those. Um, it would actually, if I put a green or blue object in a red light, it would look black uh, because it doesn't have any ability to reflect the red light. It's absorbing it. Um, so it's, it's really kind of cool. So when we put it in light, light is different than paint. Uh, if I take red light, uh, green light, and blue light and mix them together, I get white light. If I take red and blue light, I get magenta. If I take red and green, I get yellow. So notice that these wheels are inverses of one another. That's why so the, the light is referred to as additive and paints are refer, referred to as subtractive or paint pigments is a better term. Um, and so when we're adding colors of light, we get this other color. So the, the red, green, and blue are the primary colors. The cyan, magenta, and yellow are called the secondary colors, okay? And so for paints, magenta, yellow, and cyan are the primary colors of paint or pigment, and red, green, and blue are secondaries, okay? And that's just, that's a teaching technique that we use to do that. But the electromagnetic spectrum is something that we often don't talk about. Can you see this whole thing or, hang on, just move it over. Um, so you can see this. So any wave that is electromagnetic in behavior is both electric and both magnetic um, is referred to as part of the spectrum. And so we have things here that we, we want to pay attention to what's going on. Let's look at the wavelength of this light. So on the order, this is a 10 to the third is a thousand meters long. Um, and so look here, this has something called radio waves. Radio waves go from the centimeter region. So 10 to the minus one is to 10 to the minus two meters all the way up to thousands of meters long. Those are called radio, all right? Microwave, like your microwave oven, are about 10 to the minus two-ish to about 10 to the minus five or 10 to the minus six. Uh, so microwaves actually extend all the way up to this region because 10 to the minus six is the symbol for micro. Um, and these are some things that are in that scale. So microwave is a radio wave that is just a very, very short wavelength. And then down here, we have the, see where visible is turned sideways right here. Visible light is an exceptionally small spectrum of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, we see so little, the spectrum goes from 10 to the third meters long to 10 to the minus 12 meters short. But light is on the order of 10 to the minus six, 10 to the minus seventh meters um, for visible light. So we see just a very, very small piece of the electromagnetic spectrum. The ultraviolet you've heard of, that's the sun that gives you a suntan or a sunburn, um, is a shorter wavelength than visible light. Infrared is often also known as a heat light, uh, is a little bit longer than visible light. And all of the colors, the red, orange, yellow, the, the Roy G. Bibb of the rainbow are just a very, very, very small slice of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, if we keep getting shorter and shorter wavelengths, as you, as you can see those numbers here, um, we get into X-rays and gamma rays and cosmic rays and, and things that are out there, just exceptionally short. All of these wavelengths have a frequency and that's all, the frequencies are down here below. Uh, the frequencies range from a very low frequency uh, on the order of 10 to the second Hertz, 100 Hertz, uh, all the way up to the, this number says 10 to the 20th and a higher Hertz. Uh, so, Frequencies are a very broad range. Now, if you look here, the visible spectrum would come down here on the order of 10 to the 15th hertz is the frequency of light. Uh, and we'll look at light itself and, and as, as the wavelengths, we'll get an actual spectrum out for just, just the visible light section. Uh, but look at the energy here. The longer um, a wavelength is, the, the lower the frequency, the less energy it tends to carry. Out here, cosmic rays carry more energy in the unit of the electron volts, but don't worry about that. Um, so we have, it, it, this is you know the fact that X-rays and gamma rays, this, this is stuff that's in space. 
Um, space is dangerous because the radiation that's out there, electromagnetic radiation, is very, very energetic and dangerous to us. It, it would kill us. So we, it's dangerous to go to space. Um, like wearing a spacesuit has little, little to no uh, safety uh, measure in it. Um, in fact, down here at this end, the radio waves, right now where you're sitting, if you, if you can receive a radio signal or a cell phone signal, or a Wi-Fi signal where you're sitting right now, these radio waves, electromagnetic waves, are passing actually through the walls of your home and through your bodies, uh, quite literally. There, there's just so much energy there, and there's such a short wavelength overall, they pass through you. Uh, in fact, it's kind of cool. The mic, why does the microwave work? It's, it's a radio wave, and how does how do radios cook food? Um, and so one thing is kind of kind of weird here. Uh, water molecules, which you see a water molecule right here. I don't know why it's in the spot, the spectrum. It's just maybe it's the physical size of it. Um, that's right. Uh, water molecules resonate, uh, which we know what that is now. They have a resonant frequency that's right in this region of 10 to the 11th hertz, which is the frequency of a microwave. <laughs> so when you put food in a microwave, all of human food has water in it. And so what you're doing when you run it and put it in a microwave, the water's uh, molecules are forced to vibrate back and forth at a resonant frequency because of the external microwave energy. So the microwave causes the water molecules to resonate. And when they resonate, they vibrate. And that's what makes food get hot. Uh, so it's just really kind of a, a cool connection to what we were doing last chapter. OK. So. Electromagnetic spectrum is, and again, this is all in your book in chapter, uh, what is it, 15? Yeah, so you're going to go through that. Um, but this is something that may not be intuitively obvious. If you remember uh, last chapter, I made the statement that all sound waves travel at the same speed. Well, it just so happens that all light waves travel at the same speed. And so the speed of light is a fixed value. I'm not going to write all the details out. It's 2.9978953 times 10 to the eighth meters per second, but we write it this way. 3.00 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. It's incredibly fast. Um, in fact, it is the fastest speed possible in the universe. Uh, according to Einstein's theory of relativity, it is impossible to go faster than the speed of light. And there's never been any evidence that it could, that anything anything real can go faster than light. Um, so it doesn't matter whether it's blue light, and it's, I should say, speed of light in a vacuum. Um, and regardless of the color of light or the brightness of light, which would be the intensity of light, it always goes the same speed, um, which is really kind of interesting. And so this is a number. That's that's a number that I can't personally imagine. That's 300 million. Uh, that's about what is it? 186,000 miles per second. I think it's about what it is. Um, it's it's just fast. So how did uh, we discover or measure the speed of light? Anybody have a proposal for how we might go about that? And how do you measure the speed of a baseball? I mean, like a super rudimentary way would just be like standing far away from someone and having them like yeah, turn exactly. light or something. Yeah. So, I mean, this was done. A guy named uh, Galileo kind of had the same idea. And so what he did, and this is kind of a rude, crude version, he had... Uh, uh, and I can't remember what city it was in, but there were hills around the city. And so he had his uh, understudy, if you will, go stand on top of one hill with a lantern. And he went and stood on another hill. Uh, and he told the guy that what he was going to do was at the stroke of midnight, there's like a town bell uh, you know, clock that went off and rang, rang midnight. At midnight, he was going to uncover his lantern and the light was going to travel down to this other hill, which was some given distance away, not very far, a couple of kilometers. And as soon as he saw Galileo's light, he was to uncover his lantern. And so Galileo was going to use the double the distance and the time, it took the time difference to figure out the speed of light. And what they discovered 
was at midnight, Galileo uncovered his lantern. And as quick as he could, the worker, the, the, the aide, uncovered his. And Galileo actually thought he uncovered his. They thought there was a mistake. And so he got on the guys like, you uncovered yours at midnight. It was supposed to be me. But the fact was that he did wait until he saw the light. And so Galileo surmised the light was so fast it couldn't be measured. That was his decision. All right. We know it's not true. So another guy, uh, this was about 50 years later. Um, uh, oh, his name was Ola, Ola Raymer. I can't say it correctly. A Dutch guy. He said, why don't we use the moons of Jupiter? Galileo invented this telescope. We can look at it and we can look at the Jupiter, Jupiter, Jupiter moons. And so what we're seeing is the moons of Jupiter uh, were going around Jupiter, right? And so they looked at it when the Earth was actually here. They would see where it is. And they knew how fast the moons are going around Jupiter because you could sit and watch them over a period of a day. And then six months later, they looked at it and measured the position and the speed of Jupiter's moon at the same time. Okay. And so they were actually able to use the difference. And we're not doing the math of this, so don't worry about it. They were able to use the difference in positioning to figure out, and they knew the distance from here to here. They, they knew this distance across. Um, and so they used the difference in the time for the moon to get around because here we're closer. So the light had less distance to travel. Here we're further away and used this distance and the time difference. And they got a number uh, this, using this model where it was really not bad. It was like within, I think 10% or so is about what it was just using telescopes. And this was in the 1600s or so. And so they got a number and it was really fast. And Galileo was right. It was really fast. And the, you know, the mountaintop thing was just too close together to be able to measure this. And this, you know, how far is it to Jupiter? I don't know, but it's a lot farther than two mountains are away. And the, the earth had moved 186,000 miles across its orbit. Uh, and then, so this other guy named Fizeau, I can't remember his first name, uh, did another version of the experiment. And so he had a, it's called a tooth wheel. And so as this would flip by, uh, he would spin the wheel really fast and he'd look where the eye is looking through a lens. He's looking at a, uh, uh, it has a light and this is a partial mirror. Let me show you what a partial mirror is. You guys, can you see my screen? No. Oh, is it? No, okay, let me stop this on my camera again. So this is a piece of, it's, it's called smoked glass. It's a partial mirror. And so let me get my cell phone out, turn, up, turn the light on. Um, so the light's here. So this thing is partial and that it dims out a bunch of the light. And so light kind of goes through it and kind of doesn't. It's also being reflected under here. Um, I don't know if they can get that to work or not. Probably not, not bright enough. So there's a reflection underneath the light. I can't do it, in the, so I have to do it from the other side. You can see there's a reflection off of the front of it. So this is a partial, it's just like a smoked glass. It's, it's dark brown instead of any other color. Um, turn off the flashlight again. So he used this partial mirror and back to the share and so the the Fizeau experiment it's really pretty pretty interesting technology for the oh, i think this was probably the early 1800s uh, he would spin this wheel and so a light source would shine through here onto a mirror part of the light would come through so he could see it and part of the light would reflect off and go down and travel to another mirror and the, these lenses are just a focused light so it gets more intense and what would happen is that the spinning as he would spin this, the light would waver back and forth in his mirror. He'd be able to see the light bulb <clears throat> from his position and it would bounce back and forth. And he would spin this up to a given speed and the light became a stable image. And he figured out that the frequency of this was such that it, you know, the, the, the time to go from one tooth to the next tooth was actually the time for the light to travel that path and back. Okay, and let me get, I've got another version of this. Let's call it, I used it with mirrors. Um, and so this one we did um, in California, they did this experiment. They had a really bright light source and they were shining it on this. This was a, 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 this one's a octagonal shaped mirror. And so the light would reflect off of the mirror, travel down to a mirror some very far distance away, reflect off that mirror, travel back down and then here. So if this is sitting still, the person looking right here can actually see the light source that has traveled this distance, whatever that is. And so now we're spinning the light source. And so if it rotates just a fragment of, of distance, then the light 
will not be visible, but it'll be blinking on and off. And so they would spin this up and they would know that if it made it, then the light, so this face, uh, let's say that the light's here, it reflects off. And by the time it gets to, by the time this face gets to here, the light has traveled its path length. And so again, they were able to use the, the fact that this was spinning at a given speed to figure out the time for this to get from here to here in order to see that reflection. And they were able then to calculate the speed of light with some degree of precision. Uh, today, we do a different method altogether. Uh, we use lasers. <coughs> and so we actually use electronic systems. I don't have a, a picture of this one. Uh, so I've got a laser beam sitting right here. And what I do is I've got uh, a, a series of mirrors, thousands of mirrors, and I do this, and there's more mirrors here. And so the light beam comes out and it bounces back and forth between thousands of little mirrors. So that this path length becomes useful and the distance is whatever it is. But then I have a little photo detector uh, down here that says, hey, I just got hit by a laser beam. So what we do is we have a switch that turns on the computer right here when we flip the light on and it bounces back and forth. And it, when it, as soon as it gets here, it stops the clock. And our computers are now fast enough to be able to track this small amount of time. And so based on this, we now know the speed of light to five decimal places uh, consistently. Uh, my AP physics book has a number, uh, I'm not sure what it is, it might be more than that now. So the speed of light, uh, speed of light in a vacuum, of course, this doesn't show, the, it shows the short version of the three tenths of the eighth. Uh, that, but that's no good at all. It doesn't matter. It's, it's, we know it to several decimal places, much, much more reliable than we used to know. But uh, okay, so real quick rehash what we talked about. Uh, we talked about light being a particle, has both a wave and a, and a particle behavior, depending on what we're looking at. Uh, we looked at colors of light and wavelengths of light, uh, electromagnetic spectrum, polarization. Uh, and we're not doing much more than a vocab treatment on chapter 15. And that's actually all that we have in chapter 15. So if you wanna go through chapter 15, pull out the vocab stuff. Um, I can't believe it has problems in there because there's nothing in there. Uh, we do have the wave speed equation. I use V equals F lambda. And because the speed of light is constant, we actually converted it when we're talking about light, we use a C instead of a V. Uh, so the speed of light in a vacuum is the frequency of light times the wavelength. We'll use that again in the next chapter. So I'm not worried about having that uh, as something you're gonna do. So really just a vocab approach, very little concept here other than polarization. And that is all I have for this chapter. Any questions?